So yeah, it actually happened. I bought a DC-6. That giant thing sitting behind me, 117 foot wingspan, 105 feet long, over 100,000 pound gross takeoff weight, aircraft, airliner, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, it's here. It's ours. And what we're doing with it is turning it into a two bedroom, one bath, uh, for lack of a better term, airplane house. This condo, apartment, uh, airplane house, whatever you want to call it, will be used here at the Fly Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge to house our students as they're going through flight training with us. So if you're interested in all in flight training or coming up to Alaska on a little mini vacation, doing some flying, some flight tours, something like that, you could be staying in this airplane right behind me. This has been a dream for a very long time to basically live inside of an airplane or turn an airplane into a house. And this one, was destined for the scrapyard to be turned into beer cans. So we rescued it to turn it into, well, student housing. Now, a year ago, we posted about another big dream that was realized up here when we bought 115 acres to build a runway, a hangar, and a house on here in Alaska and start the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge. That was a dream for a very long time to live on a runway, to own our own airport, and it happened. And we've been working quite hard on it for the last year or so, trying to get everything up to speed around here. And of course, because we uh, can't just finish a project before starting another one, another big dream was always to turn an old airplane into a house and some sort of large airliner. And this one certainly fits the bill. There's nothing more Alaskan than a DC-6. This specific DC-6 helped basically to build the state of Alaska. Everett's Air Cargo, the company that this came from, flies fuel and freight all over Alaska. And this is a 1956 DC-6. 10,000 horsepower, four piston engines, 72 cylinders, 18 cylinders per engine, even more square footage on these wings, over 1,400 square feet of wing area than the house I grew up in. So it's a big airplane. Uh, and I know me staying next to it doesn't quite do it justice, but this thing is huge. I know it's on the ground right now. We've got big plans for it. And you're probably wondering about well, how this all even come to be possible in the first place? But before we get into all those details, we have to ask for your help here. We do need some serious help because, well, I'm just a flight instructor. I'm not an architect. I'm not an interior designer. And we have uh, a serious project on our hands here of how to actually go about designing and really building out this entire space. It is a very odd thing to design and build out a floor plan for something that's about nine feet wide, 10 feet wide, and 70 feet long in the cargo compartment here with these giant cargo doors, which hopefully we'll turn those into functioning uh, doors that'll open up to a little walkout deck there. Uh, so we've got some ideas, but we definitely want to hear all of your ideas. So please leave them in the comments below. Definitely subscribe and hit that little bell so you get notified as we post more updates about A, how we got this thing here in the first place. We'll tell you all about the move and all those logistics as well as the whole process of insulating, electrical, plumbing, all that stuff that's gonna go on in here. But before we can really do any of that, we've gotta come up with a floor plan and some sort of design. So more details on that at the end of the video. There's gonna be a link in the description below that'll give you more information on it as well. But to really fill you in on how this all came to be, if you haven't already been following along with the Pilot Lodge build here in Alaska, what we've been doing the last few episodes, getting the runway built, getting the cabins built, all that stuff, We'll go ahead and catch you up on what's been going on since last fall to get us to this place now where, yeah, we have a DC-6 in our backyard. So, of course, last fall, lots of projects to do before the ground fully froze and the snow really hit hard. Getting a little uh, lean-to built over the fuel tanks, trying to smooth out the runway just a little bit more, fill in some of the holes and low spots. We found this awesome piece of steel buried in the carport, like one inch thick, eight foot by eight foot plate steel that I'll probably turn that into a welding table when I, in all my spare free time. Went ahead and trenched a bunch throughout the yard, pulling low voltage wires so we can put in some lights and make it a little brighter around here in the winter when it's dark. And ran the last little bit of dirt through the screen plant trying to make a little bit more gravel and get that thing cleaned out. It's a pretty cool machine, really. Um, but yeah, you definitely don't want to get your foot stuck in there. Also dug out from the bushes, we found this uh, wing for the road grader. It's a snowplow wing just if only I could figure out how to attach it to the grater. And then the last ditch effort before the ground was fully frozen was try to make a little more ramp space because we have lots of airplanes around here. And this little nice low spot just to the side of the taxiway here 
really protected by those trees, really no wind in that area, and if I could cut it down just a few more feet, it'd be a great spot to park one or two airplanes, and we wouldn't have to go up the hill with them when they are on skis and it's all icy in the winter. All that work was making the dogs just thoroughly exhausted. All they really wanted to do was lay on the couch and play with uh, Steph's yarn. The other reason they were thoroughly exhausted was because Steph came home with a new puppy, and the puppy has a lot of energy. Luckily, the bigger dogs managed to put him in his place. Yes, we do have little dogs, I know. A lot of people don't like little dogs, but they travel so well, and we can put all three dogs plus two people in the airplane. And yeah, I was still out there trying to make that ramp area, and it was getting dark. It was getting very dark, and then the snow really hit. We got our first uh, eight inches of snowfall. That piled up real nicely. Lots of snow to clean off the airplanes. And unfortunately, with the 60 by 40 hangar, we can squeeze probably two of them in there, maybe three really tight. But uh, with eight airplanes on the property, yeah, that's uh, there's going to be some that are stored outside and lots of snow that has to be scraped off, especially on those fabric airplanes, fabric wings. Hate to see that big snow load on there. The metal ones I don't worry about quite as much, but obviously once it gets up to eight inches or so, it needs to come off. Also made some other cool little YouTube videos if you have and already checked those out about how to properly preheat an airplane, testing everything out. And then it was time for us to go to Florida for the holidays, get a little break from Alaska, squeezed a whole bunch of stuff into the hangar, and this little surprise too, we'll talk about that in another video. As you guys probably can guess, that is a kit airplane. And I'd love to hear in the comments below if you guys could guess what kit that is that we're going to be building starting this winter and probably running into next winter to get it completely built. As always, the Northern Lights never disappoint up here. Super beautiful. Going out there, enjoying the, uh, the green lights with all that snow around. And then it was time to sit down and design some cabins because we needed to start construction on these cabins to have at least some of them done this coming summer for students to be able to stay on site. We do have some housing on site already, but we need more bed spaces. We're looking for a total of 24 bed spaces when it's all said and done here. We also figured out how to go ice skating, not on ice skates, but with a bulldozer. Turns out they move really well sideways. Uh, kind of scary how fast they'll go sideways. But yeah, that's the fastest way to get down the hill. Also really bad to park your truck next to it. That is how my Chevy truck got some nice dents in it from that bulldozer sliding sideways. We did find a good place to store some of the airplanes. We were able to squeeze two of them into the carport. Taking them out of there was kind of an adventure. We built a custom sled to actually squeeze them in and out of the carport sideways. It was pretty <laughs> icy around there, so things did drag around pretty well. And the runway towards the end of the year there, this is getting towards, I believe, February or March through the winter. It was getting rather narrow because we had been plowing it like crazy, but that snow just kept coming. And eventually the runway went from being about 60 feet wide to, oh, I don't know, probably more in the, the 25 to 30 foot wide range. This was a little time lapse here, putting together these cabins. We're building four of them to start with, and we're building them all up here in the carport, up by the hangar in the house where all the tools and power and electricity are, because where these are gonna go, although it would have been way, way, way better to build them on site, on their foundations or on their building pads. Well, all that's actually covered in four feet of snow right now, and we've done no site prep uh, before winter hit. So we had to actually build what we could here, build them as tall as we could, got them 12 feet tall for these first two cabins that we put together, and then drug them out of the carport, pulled them out uh, so we could actually build up the rest of the way because these first two came out to be a little over six, 16 or 17 feet tall, I believe, with the roof eaves sticking up there. Um, pretty cool little one bedroom, one bath uh, with a loft in there and definitely quite the experience. I'm not a contractor or a construction person by any means. I'm a flight instructor. I do have a little bit of experience with electrical and mechanical things, uh, which certainly helps, but it was a learning curve. And honestly, uh, with no building codes up here, we just kind of went with whatever we wanted to do, throw in some insulation in there, some R20, R30, sounds good enough. Um, didn't want the insulation to be too good in the roof because we want the roof to be warm enough to actually melt some of the snow and slide that snow off those metal roofs. We did go with all metal siding on the roofs and the sides, trying to keep maintenance low because, yeah, once these are finally built and done, I would way rather spend my time flying and teaching in airplanes than building more cabins and doing maintenance on wood exteriors. Also, uh, tongue and groove ceilings, really beautiful, came out really nicely, but um, I don't think I'll ever be doing that again because A, uh, March 2022 was a bad time to be buying lumber. 
very expensive and uh, actually pretty tedious putting all that together. I thought I was saving myself time from having to hang drywall sheets up there. Drywall uh, is terrible also, but um, not as bad as the tongue and groove. And as those cabins came together, it was getting towards April by the time we had those two cleaned up. A little bit more snowfall for the year, but the snow really stopped up here right around April. And then there was really no precipitation whatsoever to speak of at all, all throughout May and June. It got pretty wicked dry out there. But those two cabins, we uh, had coming along pretty well up there by the house, by the ramp area, and we were ready to get them the heck out of there uh, because we needed that space for airplanes and for everything else going on. But of course, we had to actually clean up that building pad and, and make that area for the cabins down there by the runway. We wanted to put the cabins right on the runway so they had a nice, beautiful runway view. And this was me out there on that little tiny D4 dozer clearing out what I could for our building pad where we're going to be putting those cabins. Land clearing's fun. You get to burn things and uh, burn all that grass as it was drying out. It got wicked dry into June there. You can see these little dust devils. And a uh, quick little public service announcement here. You probably already know this, hopefully. But if you ever see one of these things on short final or you see one down the runway when you're about to take off or anywhere near you, uh, don't. Stay away from them. They are nasty to fly through and it can really wreck your day. Uh, also, what wrecks your day is when uh, Forestry comes up there and tells you that your burn piles are too big. Uh, luckily, those guys were pretty cool. They just made me put out the fires for a little bit till we got an excavator on site, which was our next big purchase. Our next big toy that came was this excavator. Uh, super cool to have that machine. That is, uh, we call it the big yellow beast, and it is a beast. It is 70,000 pounds uh, big old wide load. This thing actually came out of Soldovia. It had to be put on a barge uh, across Ketchmuck Bay over to Homer and then loaded onto this low boy trailer, brought up seven hours from Homer up to Big Lake here. And uh, it's a big machine. It burns a lot of fuel, 130 some gallon fuel tank on it, holds like 100 gallons of uh, hydraulic oil as well. It's a pretty cool tool to have uh, in, the, uh, in the tool bag there as we're building these cabins, building the runway. It was definitely a really necessary purchase, especially having a machine with a thumb like that to actually be able to pick up trees, move them around, do all sorts of fun stuff. As you can see though, uh, kind of a beginner operator here trying to hold a cell phone camera as well as work both joysticks. Yep, oops, uh, not very smooth there, that kind of hurt. Um, but things got better as I learned what all those controls did. And uh, yeah, overall it's just kind of fun to just pluck trees out of the ground a lot quicker than using that little D4. Plus the piles get a lot cleaner, just wood, not so much dirt in there. They burn a lot better. Forestry was uh, much happier with us. Uh, also a little public service announcement. Sorry if that's a little grisly for you. Um, this goes back to just general aviation and aviation in general, right? Uh, complacency, right? So I've pulled radiator caps off of many machines and many cars, many times, many trucks when the engines were hot and got away with it. And, and then I didn't. Um, yeah, it turns out the radiator cap on that excavator was a little worn. I went to take it off. It hissed. I went to tighten it. It went past tight because it was wore out and it came off. And uh, yeah, that was what was left of my right arm. Uh, that was a really fun bill to pay. I would have loved to put 10 grand uh, into diesel fuel, into the equipment rather than uh, doctor bills, but um, they cleaned up the arm pretty well and uh, it's actually doing much better now. But that was my little... Uh, Little kind of uh, check up there in the summer. You gotta have some snags every so often to keep you keep you in line and remind you to not be complacent. Uh, not just with aviation, but also things like heavy equipment, because uh, you'll kill yourself or somebody else pretty fast. But the build pad was coming along pretty well. Groundwater turned out to be a lot higher there than we expected. There is about 20 feet of fall from the east end of the runway to the west end of the runway, so I thought the groundwater level would be much lower, but turns out it's actually pretty high, which is good news for the well that we're going to be putting in. And of course, having uh, that excavator around there, well, what do you do? Uh, you just have fun uh, playing around and uh, <laughs> letting the water flow, digging trenches, draining out some of that water. It's, uh, it's a really fun machine to have doing goofy things like this, although digging a trench like that and just playing around. Probably not the best use of fuel. And of course, old equipment always breaking down, always things to do on it, and always maintenance. 
The next thing is, uh, well, why you don't let a CFI design plumbing systems for cabins because I had this brilliant idea of how I was going to save money and, and put all the utilities in one utility cabin and then have four separate cabins running off of all that. And we're going to dig all these trenches and combine all the, the sewer and the plumbing and the heating and in-floor heat for all these cabins because that'll be super nice and warm and toasty on your toes in the winter for the students that are coming up here to do ski flying with us and training through the winter with us. So we had built these insulated uprights with all this crazy pack pipe going through it for your domestic cold, domestic hot water. There's this whole domestic hot water loop that's fed from one boiler because we don't have natural gas here and we don't have much, well we do have electricity but it's really expensive so we use oil heat to heat our hot water and heat our buildings. So we built these insulated pipes and then dropped them down in these 12 foot deep trenches and yeah really should have pressure checked that system before we buried it in 12 feet of dirt. Um, hindsight not the best way we did get the domestic hole to work it's not too leaky domestic hot uh we had to come up with a different solution for that because yeah the hot water leaked underground basically we were just pumping hot water underground which would have helped with the uh snow accumulation i guess but would have been very expensive in the end and once we got the build site finally done the next two cabins we built were slightly smaller these were just little 12 by 16s uh again one bedroom one bath but a lot smaller footprint shorter as well a little bit lighter and easier to move around. They uh, don't have a loft in them. Uh, but again, all metal, trying to make them as maintenance-free as possible, and still very cute and quaint. Uh, really good cabins for people that are coming to join us for just three days or five days to come up here and get a tailwheel endorsement, or do some backcountry flying, a little mountain flying course, but aren't staying longer doing something like an instrument rating or a full private pilot course. And of course, because most folks that work here have really bad ADD, uh, we couldn't actually finish any of those cabins. We had to first, you know, just go ahead and use the new dump truck we just got to spread some dirt and build a little extension onto the runway because, hey, we got a new dump truck and we got to run it. But then finally, it was cabin moving day and cabin moving day was super duper sketchy. Um, loading these cabins uh, onto the back of this flatbed after months and months of work and well tens of thousands probably over a hundred thousand dollars just in materials cost uh, so far and we weren't even nearly done with any of these things but uh, seeing them teetering around on the back of that tow truck and you'd think that wouldn't be that bad but what's really sketchy is we had actually just moved in about 500 yards of this dirt that was super wet uh, just the day prior so this was not a very solid uh really foundation or solid place to be putting these cabins especially on top of a tow truck pretty cool how they move them though uh, although the tow truck driver refused to chain or strap the buildings down to his truck because he was afraid that if they fell off or tipped that they would take his whole truck with it my feeling on that was well hey if uh, you drop a cabin off your truck then your truck's going to go with it because I've got a lot of money and time tied up in these things the other side's a little flatter if you want to try it. But yeah, he, he didn't want to go the long no. way around. He wanted to take the shortcut, and it was pretty sketchy watching that thing tip. Hopefully, we were right on the CG of how we got that thing loaded, because that was really just a guess on the center of gravity on that uh, cabin there. Getting them into place was a huge stress relief, although there was still one to go. We had four of them moved down there. By the time we had moved four, we were feeling pretty good about the overall situation. Uh, the third one we moved was actually the largest. This was um, the second to largest. Still pretty crazy seeing essentially a 12 foot by 20 foot by almost 20 foot tall building teetering there, not really secured by anything. Uh, but he drove slow and it all went good. Nothing fell off, nothing broke. Uh, the tow truck driver was slightly agitated when he showed up and saw what we had hired him to move, although his boss had come out and looked at it previously and said, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, but uh, he was pretty happy to get those moved and then get out of there. I don't think he'll be coming back to move any more of these for us, although hopefully in the future, now that we have an excavator on site and we have all this heavy equipment, we can actually go ahead and build these things where they're going to sit and not be building them a thousand or fifteen hundred feet away from where they're finally going to go. Just the cost of moving at the time, all the extra bracing we had to put in and then remove, uh, definitely slowed us down and took a little bit more time and money than expected, but that's how construction works, right? If it's not costing more and taking longer than you think, then something must be going wrong. You must not be doing it right, because from everything I've ever heard and all of my experiences so far, everything takes longer and costs more when you're building. 
I was pretty happy though overall how it turned out in the end. The views from the cabins are pretty darn cool, especially being there right on the runway. Obviously this hodgepodge mess of cabins dropped there is not how it's going to look permanently. Uh, we're going to get them twisted around, moved around slightly, and then a little bit better orientation there. And then of course the big surprise uh, going right in the middle there. Now, we haven't actually decided if the DC-6 is going to go right in the middle of all these cabins, but I can guarantee you that an airplane, some sort of aircraft, will be going in the middle of all that. There may potentially be the possibility of another airplane showing up on the property uh, besides just the DC-6, although the DC-6 would be a pretty cool cabin to have sitting in the middle of all the other cabins. The plan for that DC-6, like we mentioned earlier, is going to be a two-bedroom, one-bath uh cabin, condo, apartment, whatever you want to call it, airplane house, huh? but two bedroom, one bath is the plan for that. As soon as we get all the cabins in place, it was time to have the well truck come out there and punch a new well for us so that we could have nice crystal clear water. And the well water up here, I know coming from Florida, well water to me sounded super repulsive because it smells really bad down there, but actually well water up here in Alaska is amazing. It is just straight up glacier water, right? Basically the Kinnick Glacier and the Matanuska Glacier melt and feed us all of our water for the property right here through that underground river of water flowing through the sand and uh, yeah it's actually really tasty uh, the well of course as always costs more than you expect especially when they showed up and the first thing they did is they backed into one of our syrups and right as they were done drilling the well it was time to start pouring concrete into the cabins we had done that once they were already in their final positions because obviously that made them a lot heavier and we were putting radiant heated floors in the cabins and so we had to put some concrete or basically a uh, some sort of uh, mortar mix on top of that before we could put the LVP down. That is uh, drilling the hole in the well for our pit list. Doing all this stuff ourselves was really cool. It was a great learning experience. You actually drill a hole 10 feet below the surface because that's our frost line here in Alaska is about 10 feet. So you gotta take the water out of the well 10 feet below ground level. This is the cabins coming along and we were in full on hustle mode doing whatever we could to get these things done. I was out there myself throwing floor in there, uh, putting that LVP, clicking it all together because just two days after this video was filmed, uh, putting the LVP in, we had students arriving and they needed a place to stay. So we had to get this done super fast. Uh, we also added a new aircraft to the fleet, that little J3, super cool little airplane for doing table endorsements, super fun. Uh, it's even capable to do a little bit of off airport training in with those tiny little 850 by sixes, a lot more challenging than flying the Super Cub on 35s in those off airport locations. And as always, the flight training, doing the tailwheel training, doing the backcountry training with those students that came up, super fun, beautiful places, uh, just epic views of these backcountry strips here that we have in Alaska, and even great camping locations, because we always like to go out and try to camp for one or two nights when people come up for that five-day backcountry flying course. Really good camping spot right on the side of the runway there with that DC-3 coming in. And of course, no flight lesson in Alaska is ever complete unless you land on a beach and then go fishing for some salmon. Uh, this was actually a really great spot early August there as the uh, silvers and reds are running. And fresh salmon is always a nice way to end a good flight lesson coming back to the lodge and cooking up some fresh fish after a long day of flying. It's hard to beat. And the places that we get to go and see when we're doing flight training out here, people say, why Alaska? Well, I did a lot of flight training in Florida, but you don't see stuff like this. You don't see a sea lion swimming along and then chasing down salmon, like a whole school of salmon coming into a creek and get to witness that as a sea lion's hunting. You don't see that in Florida. And that's just one of the million reasons of why to be up here in Alaska, aside from, uh, yeah, really good fish, hunting, all sorts of great meat up here. But of course, between all those flight lessons and all the flight training we were doing, we had to take some more time to finish up dirt work that we could do well. We could do it before the ground froze because it was already getting to be August at this time. And we wanted to create, uh, really finish up that ramp area that we had started at the beginning of this video that you saw earlier from last fall after the ground froze and I couldn't really do much more with it. Wanted to go in there and finish it up. Went ahead and buried some five gallon buckets full of concrete with chain. Some of that concrete was left over from doing the heated floors in the cabins. And so those are some serious tie downs although that low spot we dug out with the excavator 
actually is really cool. There really is no wind that hits that area, so very little need to even tie down the airplanes, but if there ever was a big blow of 80 or 100 miles an hour that comes through there in the winter, we'll definitely have everything secure. And turns out the excavator is probably the most useful machine we have around here. Although we don't have a forklift, which would be really handy, it can do a whole lot of stuff for us, loading floats, moving stuff around, picking up heavy objects. That thumb makes it really useful. And of course, it wouldn't be summertime in Alaska if I wasn't getting equipment stuck, because again, remember, I'm not a heavy equipment operator. I'm a flight instructor. So, and I'm working out here a lot of the time by myself. So yeah, when you're getting a uh, little dozer stuck in the mud, and you have to get them unstuck by yourself, well, I'll just let you guys watch and enjoy for a moment here. As we were wrapping up the building season, leaves were starting to change here in September, and things had come along really, really well. Although we were a little bit behind where we wanted to be, we only had two of those four cabins that we had started back in February actually fully complete. The other two were coming along closely there, and we did not have our crosswind runway complete. We got, well, as you can see, just about 200 feet of just tore up dirt really I even done <laughs> but we've got a lot of excavation to do from that hill there to finish that crosswind runway that's going to get pushed to summer of 2023 but luckily we do have a good solid 1200 feet of east west runway that is usable that we have been using all last winter we'll be using it all again this winter and all throughout the summer it's it's fine it's not muddy it's not soft we finally figured out by scraping off down to good gravel and getting some drainage ditches on the side that everything went well with that runway and even this little building pad here really ultimately what i learned was gray is good and drains well uh brown and black not so good that holds a lot of water and moisture and you don't want that around anywhere luckily the whole bedrock or whole base around here is just nothing but gray sand and gravel so if you can get down to that it's even okay if you're in a low spot things drain really well we don't have many water drainage issues the last thing we had to do before it got down again below freezing into the fall was put a concrete pad in front of our hangar because we were sick of walking through the mud, tracking mud and dirt into the hangar. Plus we wanted to have a good solid uh, traction surface for moving the airplanes around in the winter, something nice and easy to plow. So I said, hey, you know, it's actually pretty cheap if we do this ourselves, we'll get this, the steel, we got some wood around here, we'll build the forms. Uh, turns out it's really difficult to grade all that flat and make the base totally flat. Even with the grader and the dozer, uh, there's a skill to it. There really is a seat of the pants feel of navigating that dozer and that grader around there to get it all within a half inch or quarter inch. And you eventually end up hand raking it all smooth, bringing in more sand, trying to level everything before putting down that concrete. But we got the uh, rebar in there and got the forms put up. We got it all pretty darn close. Uh, when they asked me if I was going to be pouring a four inch slab or six inch slab or eight inch or what I was going to be doing, it was um, four to seven inch slab is what we determined, or maybe a three and a half to seven inch uh, based on the undulations that I wasn't quite able to fully smooth out and kind of gave up on that after a while. But I uh, just rented a little plate compactor from Home Depot to, to get it all mostly done and figured, hey, what the heck, rather than messing with this for more and more days, we'll just go ahead and order a few extra yards of concrete to uh, to fill in those those low spots and doesn't hurt to have it a little extra thick there. When it was finally time to pour concrete, had a few buddies come out and give me a hand. Uh, big learning experience here was I'll never actually pour another slab by myself. Again, without some serious professional help, might actually be part of the process, but definitely hire a contractor for it because there was a little bit more to it than I expected to get that stuff smooth. And this 24 foot long screed to do 1500 square feet of concrete, just not, not the easiest thing to do. And then we were trying to do this broom finish to make sure there was texture and it was air and train concrete that I didn't really understand, but there's these little bubbles in it that you can't pop because you need that for frost protection. Either way, uh, we'll be calling out some serious outside help for the next uh, concrete pour for when we build the big hangar next summer. The cabins though have come along really well. Interiors look great. We have students staying in there and overall pretty happy with them. All the feedback we've gotten has been amazing. 
And then, of course, the last little project here was take out some trees and clear up that end of the runway for next year so we can bring in some more dirt there, extend the runway somewhat, and uh, make a larger turnaround area for when we're on skis. By late September, the leaves are falling off the trees, and it's getting to be that time of year. If we're going to go move this aircraft, we got to do it now. And there is that big, beautiful DC-6, uh, the one with the engines on It's actually not ours because ours has, well, a few parts missing from it. Totally fine, though. we got to, obviously, not the engines, not a few of the other pieces and parts. But uh, yeah, we couldn't quite afford a running flying DC-6. We could afford one that would have otherwise been turned into beer cans. And so we saved that airplane from the scrapyard and we'll be turning that into that two bedroom, one bath, uh, little house or airplane house, whatever you want to call it, that you can come stay in here as you're doing some flight training with us. Even if you're not going to do flight training, you can always come up and stay in it. But we would highly encourage you to take an introductory flight lesson. There is nothing else better in the world than flying up here in Alaska. And if you're gonna do any sort of flight training, although it is a little bit more expensive up here in Alaska, our fuel is pretty pricey up here, uh, well, it's still an amazing experience seeing the sights from the air. This whole process of taking apart this airplane was quite the learning experience, quite the learning curve. Luckily, had a few good friends helping us with it. Definitely owe Steph for being a good sport and getting up there in the cold, working with me on that, taking the wings off of it, getting it ready to go onto a trailer and then haul some of those other pieces on the trailer. We will cover a lot more of that in the next episode, show you that whole process of disassembly. It was quite the ups and downs throughout the week that it took, but it, we did get it all done within about a week and then had to make one more trip up there to get it finally loaded and uh, ready for transport. But we do need a little bit of help with this project. Although it is finally here on site in our backyard at the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge, we do need a little bit more help figuring out the floor plan and the design because designing a floor plan for essentially an a 10 foot wide by 70 foot long space is kind of awkward and there's already some big cutouts and windows and cargo doors that we have to design around and uh, again, I'm a flight instructor. I'm not a architect or a designer or a general contractor or anything like that as you can tell from the earlier parts of this video and all the mistakes we've made but this thing is just it's awesome I'm super excited about it it's a big beautiful airplane and any ideas that you guys have of how to design that there are links in the description below there's a little Dropbox file that you can actually download some uh, some videos of the interior and exterior and a rough floor plan that I kind of sketched of the dimensions of the floor and midway up and the, the round tube and all those different spaces and some ideas we already have for it. You can download that packet if you'd like and uh, use that kind of as a resource to just kind of rough sketch out some ideas you might have. And if anybody does put forth some good ideas and we decide to go with your floor plan, we'll have a little bit of a contest out of it. Whoever comes up with the best design will get a few nights free stay here in the DC-6 so you can actually come up and stay here at the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge. So any ideas that you do have, please share them with us. We'd love to hear them, uh, especially how to build the bedrooms, the bathrooms, how to how to finish out that space, what sort of interior to use, because essentially it's not just a round tube. You're not just tiling a round tube for a shower on the inside there. If you've ever tiled a shower, well, tiling a flat wall is hard enough, but a curved wall is really hard. And then imagine a, a curved and tapered wall. So it's basically like tiling the inside of an ice cream cone. So I'm not even sure if we can tile a shower on the inside of this airplane, because that, that exterior wall is going to be uh, kind of a challenge there. But any ideas that you guys have, would love to hear them. Definitely stay tuned for a lot more coming about, well, the new DC-6 airplane house at the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge. Super excited for that. It's going to be a really fun winter project as we build it all out and get it done this winter so that it will be ready for you to come visit and stay in here summer of 2023. As always, guys, thank you for watching. If you cannot fly every day, then fly 8 and we will see you guys in the next airplane house building video.